From the dawn of time, wherever man has gone, he's left his mark, literally. He's scratched, hacked, and scraped his lines, circles, and squiggles on the nearest thing at hand, usually rocks. What he's also left behind is a bunch of experts, all of them arguing about just what he meant by those marks, and also arguing about who made them and where the people came from, and how their theories contradict other forms of history. Our science specialist, Eve Savory, takes us on a rocky tour of those marks, or petroglyphs, as the experts usually call them. It's dawn on an autumn equinox in Colorado. As the shadow of this rock falls where what might be an ancient European language seems to predict it should, these people say our view of history is being challenged. If what we're saying here is true, it means that the history that we all learn in school, and that is accepted as, as a reasonable facsimile of history, turns out to be wrong in very important points. The Vikings who built this settlement in Newfoundland a thousand years ago are generally believed to be the first Europeans to see North America. But some people think Europeans were here long before that. This is a petroglyph of a very old ship. It's made in the style that was used to draw ships on the rocks in Sweden. Scott Monaghan, an independent film producer, followed a small group of linguists and amateur archaeologists. They took him to sites they say prove Europeans were here perhaps 2,000 years before Columbus. The shape of this is rather interesting. Archaeologists say Indians sharpening tools made these marks found at numerous locations. This man says no, it's a language. You see the two strokes up there, yes. it's a D. A language so known as Ogun, ancient Celtic. This is how it looks in the 12th century Book of Ballymote. It is these seasonal measurings predicting equinoxes and solstices that have the group excited because at six sites the Ogun translations are proving accurate. As well, the group says it finds references to the European zodiac, the twins, Gemini. And here they see Anubis, the Egyptian god of darkness, worshipped in pre-Christian times. E. Savory, CBC News. Colorado's Ogham controversy began with these grooves discovered in 1975. They were found by Dr. Don Rickey, chief historian for the Bureau of Land Management, while hiking near the site of an 1868 Indian battle which killed an ancestor in the U.S. cavalry. Having read Barry Fell's America B.C., Ricky felt these marks resembled Ogham in Scotland. But archaeologists soon conspired to derail Ricky's excitement and squash any connection to the old world. State archaeologist Ripito joined a July 1977 site survey and rejected the theory that this is Ogham's script. Nonetheless, the site was nominated to the National Register of Historic Places, assuming Native Americans did the carving. These presumptions hold even today, although much clearer examples of translated Ogham verified by archaeoastronomy have been found nearby, such as in Crack Cave. The Denver Post reported in September 2005, these are carvings plains Indians created maybe 700 years ago to mark the equinoxes. The Post reporter later told us a Forest Service archaeologist told her that studies had concluded this, but when asked to see them, Comanche National Grasslands District Forest Service Ranger Thomas Peters said, no such studies existed. Seems archaeologists consider preservation a sacred trust, especially when it comes to preserving their own dogma. Since 1973, I have been recording ancient inscriptions and petroglyphs in this area. So uh, when I was brought to this cave in 1978, my attention immediately focused on this petroglyph of the canine figure. And uh, I looked at it and said, uh, this is Egyptian. And everybody with me just laughed and laughed. And later I verified that it was Anubis, the god of darkness and death. Uh, up here it gives instructions that there will be a rite or a ceremony at sunset, uh, the rites of Baal, which shall be acted out. And um, it is amazing to us the first time we saw what did happen right at Equinox. As with most revolutionary discoveries, theories change and strengthen as more is found and understood. After more than a generation of study, the carved icons and their relative placement to each other 
seem to reveal the Anubis cave as one of the world's foremost surviving examples of Mithras worship. This pre-Christian spirituality, tied to the stars, the planets, the moon, and the sun, was popularly practiced among Roman soldiers and the far-flung Celtic culture. By learning the celestial rhythms and advancing through the ranks, Mithrists hoped to cleanse their souls while on Earth. The cube is an interesting feature on this panel. We know from Plato and his Timaeus that the cube represents the Earth because it's very stable. You notice that it's a three-dimensional square braced on many corners. There were other features that are triangles and they represent the less stable things of the Earth such as the air, the water, and fire. The final step up the ladder is the seventh and top step and that is for the sun god Mithras the human form of the leader was known as Pater, and which means father. And we have here the testes and the erect phallus, which represents fatherhood. And we also have the rayed crown that he's wearing, which we're told came from Bahram I of Iran. Mithras is expected to maintain the rising of the sun, the setting of the sun, and all of the planets and constellations in their proper order and functioning. Here's a Mithraic temple excavated in London. The walls were lined with pillars and participants sat between them. Up front was an altar. Iconography was on the wall behind the altar and the niche suggests there may have been a statue there. This old Mithraic star map from Iran, for example, features from left to right the twins, Gemini, the hunter, Orion, and the bull, Taurus. These also are, are representing constellations. There's a star map that really is another layer behind this. Mithras is also in the position of Perseus, and the cube is in the position of Auriga. Then we have Taurus over here, Orion is this figure, as well as Cetus over here. And Folks who are familiar with constellations know that these are in their correct relative position or as you would see them in the sky. Here at a southeastern Colorado site named the Sun Temple, a signature dawn alignment occurs twice a year at Lunasa and Bealtaine. A revealing star map dates one inscription to 1534 years ago. We have both the constellation Gemini and the three planets and when we projected them with Evans and Sutherland, they all fit. These little one-inch cross yeah. marks are the stars. Yeah. These big three-inch cross marks are, are the, planets. the planets. Well above the floor of this amphitheater-like location is another key ogham. It is known as the triogum, in honor of the rebus or word picture on the right. These marks have been translated from Old Gaelic to read, the sun ring along with the shoulder by means of sun and hill. The trunk was an actual stem line and the picture honored the inspiration for Ogham, trees. Here is the Gemini inscription, the noble twins. This spells that out in ancient Gaelic, in Ogham writing. Now, this writing is superimposed on a pattern of plus marks, which we interpret to be the stars of the noble twins in the sky, in the constellation Gemini. Now, superimposed on that pattern is also three plus marks, Saturn, Jupiter and Venus. The um, interesting thing about this constellation is that it matches a pattern that was present in the sky in 471 AD on the um, cross quarter day in August, the uh, 8th of August. And that day is marked by the circle you see there. You see it over there? And by a um, shelf on the rock up here which lines up with the sun on at sunrise on the 8th of August still does so we have sunrise the constellation is above the horizon the sun is below the horizon and there are three planets to be seen there quite a beautiful sight what we have here is two intersecting diagonal lines here they are straight and they intersect here and they point 23 and one half degrees to the east and 23 and a half degrees to the west of due north. 
This is straight north here, right halfway between them. The only one of these cross lines that actually lies on the plane of the ecliptic, as I described it to you, is this one here going out in a southeasterly direction. It is on the plane of the ecliptic. This one, instead of being on the plane of the ecliptic, is bent down so that this angle is, as accurately as you can measure it here, is exactly the latitude of this site. Now here is another line, this line coming through is deflected a little. It looks like almost a straight line here, but it's, uh, it's not, and it's pointing directly to where the sun sets on the horizon yonder on the first day of summer, on the summer solstice. So the people who put this in here understood a lot more about astronomy than a lot of people in modern day life. Magnetic declination here is nearly eight degrees east. A compass resting at the intersection confirms true north bisects the lines 23 to 24 degrees either side of it, matching the tilt of the Earth's axis to the ecliptic. No surprise, this place is nicknamed the Compass Cave. Outside of Fallon, Nevada, the curious have come to learn more about an ancient society of people who once called this cave home. They discovered that the cave was underwater when it was formed 20,000 years ago until 7,000 years ago. Not far from this cave, a mummy has been discovered. A mummy that may reveal the secrets of an even older society. One that dates back to the dawn of civilization. This is extremely significant. This is unprecedented. We haven't had a find of this importance in my lifetime. One thing that makes the mummy, known as the spirit cave man, so important are these fine hand-woven fabrics discovered at the burial site. These textiles represent a, an extremely sophisticated ability to weave fabric by hand in a time where we didn't realize that people were doing that before. The mummy was discovered tightly bound up in this matting. Out of respect for the dead, this photograph and this drawing are the only two pictures scientists will allow to be publicly displayed. Recent tests reveal that the mummy is 9,000 years old. That's three times older than any other mummy yet discovered in North America. That news has stunned archaeologists because a mummy can tell scientists how people back then lived, what diseases they had, even what food they ate. Scientists can get that information by studying the mummy's DNA. That requires cutting a small piece of tissue from the body. And it shouldn't be done. And that, says Paiute Shoshone tribal leader Alvin Moyles, is desecrating the dead. But scientists claim that the mummy is so old that he couldn't possibly be related to the Paiute Shoshones, that the mummy's tribe was here thousands and thousands of years before anybody else. They do not appear similar to any living Native American in North America. They have receding cheekbones, narrow face, long face. Some, some Indians have some of those traits, but as a group, those are Caucasoid traits. The two sides are now caught in a catch-22. One way to prove kinship is through the DNA test, but the tribe doesn't want that. Whether or not scientists ever get to study the mummy is a matter for the U.S. government's Bureau of Land Management to decide. The DNA evidence would be definitive for ruling out certain groups. You can't necessarily prove with it which group it was, but you can rule out contending parties. Until a decision can be made, the mysterious spirit cave mummy will remain trapped in limbo. Yeah, he's kind of in the legal, spiritual, ethical limbo. In Carson City, Nevada, Vince Sterla, Channel 3 reports. Even mummies can't avoid the law and bureaucracy, it appears. Many archaeologists agree it's entirely possible the mummy is not related to any existing tribe in North America. Yeah, it sounds like uh, the mummy predated most of the Indian tribes from that, that part way. of the country.